Okay, it's already 10.30. So welcome uh, again to uh, seminar GADEPS. So today, Gal Binyamini is going to talk, about, to talk about point counting for foliations of our number fields. Okay, go, go ahead. Okay, thank you. But by the way, I should finish uh, in one hour, right? That's uh... Yeah, it is 55, one hour, yeah, it is. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. It's nice to to give this uh, seminar in Rio, even though only by Zoom. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, kind of a, uh, an overview of several results. It's mostly going to be about uh, foliations, which is, I guess, close enough to the topic of the seminar. But then uh, toward the end, I really will talk about uh, periods. So. I think it will be right up uh, everybody's alley. So, okay, I'll start with uh, I'll start with talking a little bit about uh, growth versus zeros. So, the the general uh, kind of the, the general idea I want to kind of convey to you is that there are many problems in uh, dynamics, the number theory, and other areas that can be reduced to counting roots of analytic functions. Okay, and the, the, the problems I talk about will be an exa example of this. So, and there are various ways of trying to do this, trying to get uh, bounds for the number of zeros. Some of them topological, like uh, from intersection theory, things leading to Bezout theorem and that kind of thing. There are some uh, kind of real geometric methods, like uh, Hovansky's theory of funomials, for those of you who have heard it. And there's also a complex analytic method. And, and that is the method that I will be focused on in this talk. So the, the, the way to count uh, zeros of holomorphic functions is to look at their growth. So, let, so just uh, consider this lemma of, uh, well, it can be attributed to many people, but let's say Jensen. So it says that the number of zeros of a holomorphic function, let's say you have a, a domain U and you have a, function which is holomorphic on the closure of u uh, and you have a compact subset k and you want to know how many zeros are in k so the lemma says that the number of zeros is going to be bounded by some constant so this constant depends only on the geometry of u and k it doesn't depend on f it's something like the hyperbolic diameter of k inside the riemann surface u but never mind you have some constant and then this is multiplied by the logarithm of the ratio between the maximum on the big domain, u bar, and the maximum on the small domain, k. Sorry for just a uh, Mari? Mari? It's, uh, can you uh, down the nose? It's noisy. The, uh, everything. Yeah. Uh, no, no, just cutting and stuff. Sorry, yeah, my wife is cooking. I'm doing this from home. Um, so yeah, so anyway, the, we say that the number of zeros is a constant times the logarithm of this ratio. So you should think, for example, about uh, an analytic function looks something like a polynomial. So it's something like uh, the product of you know, z minus alpha, where alpha varies over the roots. And then if you have many of these roots alpha, then your function looks Right, so it should it should exhibit kind of exponential growth, and the logarithm of this growth will be roughly n. So I mean that is the intuition behind this uh, lemma, and it's not very hard to prove using uh, potential theory. Um, so it means that if we want to estimate the number of zeros, we just should estimate the growth. Uh, so I want to kind of show you how this can this idea can be used for. Uh, counting the number of intersections between a trajectory of a vector field and an algebraic hypersurface. Okay, so that's the first result I want to show. So I'll take a C, which is a rational vector field. So I mean, uh, you know, a vector field in Cn whose each of its coefficients is a rational function. And I want moreover that it is defined over the algebraic numbers or same as to say it's defined over a number field, defined over some uh, 
finite extension of Q. And I'll let gamma be one of the trajectories of this vector field and K a compact subset. Uh, now for any polynomial in N variables P, I'll denote by this uh, sigma P, the union of trajectories where P vanishes identically. Okay, so that is basically the set where there is nothing to count. And for, I'm interested in counting the zeros of a polynomial P on a trajectory. Well, if it vanishes identically, then you have nothing to count, and we will try to be counting kind of away from this bad set. So it turns out that this set is actually algebraic, and uh, you, you can get the following bound for the number of uh, zeros in terms of the distance to this set. So I'm saying that the number of zeros in K, so I'm restricting not to the whole trajectory, but to a compact subset. This is essential because the trajectory, you know, it's transcendental. It, it will probably intersect every algebraic hypersurface infinitely many times. So I, I have to restrict to a compact subset. But, but once we restrict to a compact subset, then the number of intersections between this K piece of a uh, trajectory and the algebraic hypersurface defined by P is bounded by some constant depending on uh, K and C. Actually, we can, we can kind of give sharp estimates for these constants, but never mind now, times this thing that you see in red here, so some function of D, uh, well, happens to be D to the 2 N squared times log D, uh, times the log of the inverse distance between the trajectory and this bed set, the set of uh, of tra trajectories where you are identically zero. Okay, so it means that, uh, well, on, on this sigma p, we cannot count, and if we are away from this sigma p, then we do have a bound. The bound is polynomial in D, and it kind of degenerates logarithmically as you approach this bed set. So in most of the applications, the, the main point, and the thing that I kind of wanted to achieve when I proved this theorem was that this is polynomial in D. In the degree of p. Okay, so when you get bounds that are polynomial, so, uh, that, uh, your term logarithm of the inverse distance to k from sigma p, it is of the same Jensen type nature. Yeah, I will show how it comes up, and it does. I mean, it, it kind of the reason that you get log of something is exactly because we are applying Jensen. So I will give a brief sketch. This is this is not a complicated proof. I will sketch it in the the next slide. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it comes from Jensen. Uh, so well, I just want to comment that, I mean, this is not a very hard theorem, what you see here. And actually, in this paper in IMRN, uh, the, the, the main point was to eliminate this log dist term. So I kind of showed that if you have a certain condition that comes from differential Galois theory, then actually you can forget about this term. And for example, that condition is always satisfied for any system of free differential equations. So, I mean, the, the, that was kind of the main point of that paper, but for this talk, I'm going in a different direction. So I will be interested in this uh, log distance term for some other generalizations. So let me just show you roughly how the proof of this theorem works. It's not complicated. Any questions first? Okay, so, Basically, I just want to show that this idea of growth versus zeros is very well suited for this. I mean, you, it kind of, everything fits naturally to, to get exactly an estimate on the growth, and, and uh, you can easily get this result in that way. So in order to estimate the number of zeros of P on K, as I said, I need to estimate P from, I want to estimate the log of this ratio. I want the maximum of P on the, on the big set, U, and I want the maximum of on a smaller set k. So first of all, to get the bound on the big set, it, it's not difficult. I mean, because uh, you, we just have some bounded domain, we have a polynomial, so you know, you just estimate everything from above in the, in the natural way, and you get an upper bound for log of p. So kind of the difficult part is to get a lower bound on the compact set. Right? Remember, it was the ratio between the maximum on the big set and the maximum on the small set. So we need an upper bound on the big set, and we need a lower bound for the maximum on the small set. So that's usually kind of the, the, the part which is difficult, where you need some assumptions. Like here, we are assuming that 
k is a part of a trajectory of a vector field, and we will need to use this. Uh, by the way, you can al already see here that, I mean, if you're going to get such a lower bound, definitely this lower bound has to degenerate as you approach sigma p. Because as I said, sigma p, it's the place where just the polynomial vanishes identically on the trajectory. So, I mean, if you are close to a point where p vanishes identically, then p is going to be very small. And so you have to somehow stay away from this area if you hope to, to apply this growth versus zeros uh, idea. OK, so how do we get a lower bound? So first of all, by Cauchy, if you want to find the lower bound for the, for the maximum of this function on k, it's enough to find the lower bound on some one of the derivatives. But if the function is uniformly small, then all of the derivatives are also going to be uniformly small, just because of the Cauchy estimates. So it would, if we want to show that the function is not uniformly small, it's enough for us to find the derivative, which is not uniformly small. So we want to make sure that one of these derivatives is, is not too small. Now, notice that the common zeros of all of these derivatives, that is exactly sigma p, right? Because, I mean, at every point, if all of the derivatives of p vanish, that exactly means that as you derivate p along the trajectory of xi, you get identical zero. Okay, and that is the definition of sigma p. So, I mean, these are all polynomials. p, the, the xi of p, xi square of p, these are all polynomials, and their common zeros are sigma p. So you already see how kind of this uh, sigma p enters into the estimates. Now, the last step that we need is it's not enough to know that sigma p is the, z is the common zero of all of these. I want to know kind of a bound on how many of them I need. Okay, it's clear that you need only finitely many of them just by nothirianity, right? These, these are polynomials. You get a sequence of polynomials here, and the ideal that they generate, the common zeros, is going to stabilize at some point. But I want to say that actually you can estimate when it stabilizes, and you can get an estimate which is polynomial in D. So this is called duplicity estimates, trying to to say what can be the maximal order of zero of a polynomial through a trajectory of a vector field. So there are many multiplicity estimates of this kind. Maybe the, 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 uh, if there's two kind of sophisticated approaches, one by Nesterenko and one by Gabrielov. And uh, kind of the main point is you, you can get it polynomial in D, or even you can get it sharp. You can get something which is a constant times D to the N. Okay, so that is the best you can expect because the dimension of the space of polynomials is d to the n, constant times d to the n. So you can always cook up a zero just by linear algebra that has roughly order d to the n. So multiplicity estimate says that, in fact, you will never get more than a constant times d to the n. This is, I mean, initially due to Nesterenko. Then Gabrielov proved something similar with d to the 2n. And I later sharpened Gabrielov's method also to give d to the n. But, uh, but it doesn't matter. Even for everything I see here, you just need some polynomial in d. OK, so, so we have, I mean, the, the common zero of these uh, first n polynomials, p up to xn of p, this is the, the set sigma p. Now, we need another kind of big result. It's what is called the Diophantine Loisevich equality. So again, there's several versions of them that maybe the first one is due to Brown Noel. And what this theorem says is that if you have a collection of polynomials defined over a number field, they can only be small near a common zero. Okay, so it's very similar to the classical research inequality, except uh, you, you assume that everything is defined over a number field, and then you get a really explicit constant. So if you have, for instance, a collection of uh, polynomials that has no common zeros, then you can give an absolute lower bound for their evaluation at any point. Right? It's the only reason why all of these polynomials together are going to be very small at a particular point is if this point is very close to a common zero. In this case, I mean, these common zeros are sigma p. So in our context, it means that if you take any point, one of these first n derivatives is going to be roughly as big as the distance to sigma p up to some power. 
And then after you take log, this, this power vanishes, it goes into a constant. So this is where you get such a term, log of the inverse distance. Okay, so that's it. That's the proof of this theorem that I showed in the previous slide. And uh, so this is already quite a powerful uh, result. And once you get such a polynomial asymptotics for the number of zeros, you can use it to say something about counting rational points and algebraic points. And, and that is kind of what I'm going to talk about uh, in, the, in the rest of the, the talk. But I mean, to be really interesting, it would be good if we could do it for several variables. Kind of, it's very useful to do this kind of thing, but in the applications, usually you want it not for a curve. You want it for, you know, like the Bazoo theorem, for example. I mean, there is, there's a theorem that says that a single polynomial of one variable, if it has degree d, it will have d zeros. But I mean, a, a much stronger and more useful theorem is the Bazoo theorem in several variables, right? That tells you that if you have an intersection of n hypersurfaces, in C to the n, then the number of common zeros is bounded by the product of the degrees. But the question is, can we do something like this? And kind of the main obstacle is that this growth versus zeros doesn't work so well in several variables. I mean, there, there are some, kind of some results in this direction, but it's much less straightforward to do this growth versus zeros once you're working with functions in several variables. I, I can, maybe after the talk, if somebody is interested, I can explain what are the kind of the technical reasons for this. But anyway, let me nevertheless formulate a result in higher dimensions. OK, so I'll just kind of naturally generalize what I was talking about before. So before I took a C, which was a vector field, and now I'll take a collection of commuting vector fields. OK, so I have C1 up to Xn. They are a collection of commuting vector fields. Again, they are algebraic and defined over some number field. Uh, and OK, so this replaces my one vector field. And now I want to replace this set that I had before, sigma p. Right? That was the main player in the previous theorem. So now instead of taking one polynomial, I'll take a variety of codimension n. Right? So I have kind of n commuting vector fields. They, they span leaves of an n-dimensional foliation. And I would like to intersect it with an algebraic variety of codimension n. <coughs> so this time I'll denote by sigma v the points where the points p where the intersection between v and the leaf is improper. OK, so a proper intersection here would mean a zero dimensional intersection, right? Because the dimension is equal to the codimension. So generically, we expect them to intersect only in isolated points. And then we can hope to count. But if at some point you know, the leaf happens to intersect my variety in, in a whole curve, then there's nothing to count. Okay, so this set sigma v is the set of things that we want to count. It's the set where we can't count, sorry. The set away from which we want to count. And now, uh, okay, let me just fix some notation. So I'll denote by this uh, blackboard b, the unit ball. Uh, I'll just, I need to restrict to some compact domain again. So I'll, I'll just restrict to a ball. And I'll denote by uh, this curly B inside curly L a ball in the C coordinates. Okay, so I have uh, some natural coordinates on my leaves because I have a uh, generating vector fields, C1 up to Cn. So I'll just take a ball in the coordinates that I get from this. Again, it's not very important just to fix some constant. So, I mean, you can think just about some compact sets, but I, I just take balls instead. Uh, and finally, this what, is one important. What is, Gal, what is curly yeah? L? So curly L is any leaf of the foliation. Sorry, yeah. See, yeah, I don't have it. So L is any of the is any leaf in the foliation. This curly B is like a, a compact ball inside the leaf. Okay, so L would be a replacement for what for gamma that I had before. Gamma was like a one-dimensional trajectory, and here L is an n-dimensional leaf. And finally, I denote by delta v the maximum of the degree and the log height. Okay, that's, uh, that's kind of the important notation to remember here. Um, so let me just, uh, well, degree of v, I guess you, you understand what it is. Now, the log height, if you don't know what it means, uh, there's various ways to, to define the log height of a variety. But I mean, for, for everything that I say, it will not be very important. So you can just think, for instance, that 
your variety is defined by some collection of polynomials. And then the log height is just, uh, you know, the sum of the logarithms of all the coefficients of these equations. Okay, so it's, it's just some number that measures the arithmetic complexity of the variety. How big are the numbers that you need to... So, Cal, use how to you need to assume that uh, if instead of the number field K, you work just with Q and then log height, is the uh, valuation on the rational numbers, which is the uh, biggest of the numerator and denominator. I mean, that's for a number, certainly, yeah. That, that would be the log height of a number. But here I'm talking about the log height of this variety V. OK, yeah? so th th then you do this for all coefficients. So basically, for, yeah, all coefficients take a sum, for example, or maximum, it doesn't matter. Uh, so that's uh, the biggest, uh, the, the amount of computer memory you need to uh, encode your variety. Yeah, so I think that is even formally correct. <laughs> kind of, uh, so the log i is kind of how many bits do you need to, to encode the variety in some canonical fashion, like Grobner basis or something. Okay, anyway, so uh, don't worry too much about it if you don't know it. It's uh, any definition that you, any reasonable definition will be equivalent because I'm always taking uh, just some polynomial in this. So uh, it's not really important how you normalize it. Uh, okay, so now the theorem is basically just generalizing what we had before. It says that if you have a variety of codimension n and such an n-dimensional uh, foliation, then the number of intersections between this compact ball and the variety is bounded by a polynomial in this delta v like a degree and the height. Also delta C, just a similar thing for the, for the vector field that generates a foliation, and this log distance term. Okay, where, where this time we're taking the log distance to, the, to this appropriate set, sigma of V. Okay, so I can't talk about uh, the proof of this theorem. It will, it will, it will take me the whole, uh, the whole lecture. The idea is kind of similar. I use growth versus zeros, except that you have so, to, uh, again, uh, your result is of the following form. You estimate the number of uh, zeros of a certain function, and your estimate turns worse and worse as long as your function approaches the identical zero. Right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So when you, when you approach this sigma v, it means something kind of approaches identical zero, except here, you know, it could be, here it's several functions in several variables. So it could be you have two functions and they kind of approach to have a common uh, curve of zeros. It's not that one of them is identically vanishing. They, uh, they approach the locus where they have a common curve of zeros. And you have one function is say xy is equal to zero as an, and another function is xy is equal to epsilon. So as epsilon tends to zero, you, you kind of, you get closer and closer to some bad intersection, but without one of the functions being identically zero. That's why these things are more complicated when you're working in several variables. Okay, then that's exactly about the meaning of the word uh, improper intersection or degeneracy. Yeah, yeah. So the degeneracy means the wrong dimension. So here it doesn't mean identical vanishing, but just the intersection of the wrong dimension. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I mean, the proof is also using growth versus zeros. That's where this log distance term comes from. But uh, I will not go into the proof. I want to go in a different direction. So I want to talk a little bit about point counting, which is the main application uh, that I want to apply this theorem for. So I'll just do a, a very brief kind of overview of the, this uh, so-called Pila-Wilkie theorem on point counting. So the theorem is as follows. Let's take any set in Rn. And I'll denote by this the set is A, I denote by AGH, the set of points that have degree, and Galois degree, so kind of the, their degree over Q is bounded by G, and their log height is bounded by H. Okay, and I'm interested in, in counting the points in such a thing. So I'm counting algebraic points in terms of their degree and in terms of their log height. And uh, the theorem of Pila and Wilkie from 06 says that suppose you have a set which is definable in O minima structure. Just if you don't know these words, then, then just uh, forget about it for a moment. 
some kind of nice set. And suppose that this set contains no germs of semi-algebraic curves. Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming that I have uh, a set that is kind of completely transcendental. There's nothing algebraic inside it. Then the theorem says that for every epsilon, the number of points in uh, points of degree g and log height h is bounded by some constant depending on g and epsilon times e to the power epsilon h. But usually this is written not in the logarithmic height, it's written in the, in the absolute height. And then instead of e to the epsilon h, you just see h to the epsilon. I mean, if you've ever seen, I mean, big H to the epsilon. If you've ever seen this theorem, the, um, you would have seen uh, that formulation. But because I'm going to talk about uh, things involving log heights, it's more convenient for me to state like this. So it kind of says that uh, the, the growth is sub-exponential in the log height. It's less than e to the any epsilon times H. Now, a few comments about this theorem. So first of all, this definable in O-minima structure, it's a general framework for studying tame sets in model theory. But if you don't know it, you can think, for example, about compact semi-analytic sets. So it means you, you take a set that you can define using uh, analytic functions, analytic equalities, and analytic inequalities in some compact domain. So any set like this would be definable in a certain O-minima structure. Uh, and also I should comment that this is not the general statement. The general statement says something more. It gives you some information, even if you do have algebraic curves in your set, but just for simplicity, I'm stating it like this. Okay, so kind of the, my main reason for looking at these uh, results about counting intersections between transcendental sets and algebraic varieties is to try to sharpen this Spiller-Wilkie theorem. Uh, OK, so let me show you a sharpening of this pillar wilkie theorem. So now let's suppose that like, our transcendental set is this uh, intersection between my uh, an algebraic variety V and my leaf L. And suppose that these sets don't contain semi-algebraic curves for any leaf. Okay, so I, I'm not considering just one transcendental set. I'm looking at the entire foliation. I'm looking at all the leaves. And suppose that these intersections never contain any semi-algebraic curves. Okay. Then I'm saying that when you count the number of points in such a compact ball intersected with V, it's going to be polynomial in G and H. Okay, so it's, it's much stronger than, so here we had just a constant depending on G, and we had like sub-exponential in H. Okay, but here if we, are taking, if we are taking A to be such an intersection, the intersection between a ball and uh, a ball of my foliation and the variety, then the bound is actually going to be polynomial in both G and H. Okay, and you can get such a result. I mean, it, it requires some work, but I mean, eventually, in order to get such a result, you must have a polynomial bound for the number of intersections between uh, you know, algebraic varieties and transcendental states. So once you have such a polynomial bound, it's plausible to get this kind of result. It, it's not immediately enough, but at least it, it makes it plausible. Gal, Gal, this is a bound, right? It's not equality. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I write poly G, this is like a symptotic notation, like a O of something. So I mean, it is a, it belongs to this asymptotic class. So it's bounded by some polynomial in G and H. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions about the formulation? Uh, when you say at infinity, how do G and H go to infinity? Or is that whichever way? I'm, I'm just saying that there exists some polynomial such that the left-hand side is less than or equal to this polynomial in G and H, I mean, for any G and any H. OK, OK, thank you. No, I mean, this poly, it's just like a placeholder for some explicit polynomial that I'm not writing. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. How, how the radius of the ball affect this polynomiality in the GH side? Yeah, so in fact, the radius of the ball also enters logarithmically. So kind of the full result is I have explicit dependence on the generators of the foliation, the size of the ball, um, the size of the ambient ball that contains everything. So here I'm just kind of giving a simplified uh, version. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the radius of the ball enters logarithmically into okay. the complete ball. 
Okay, so first of all, improving this kind of improvement, going from E to the epsilon H to just a polynomial H, this is called Wilkie's conjecture. Okay, so Wilkie conjectured it for a, a specific structure, for the, the structure R sub X, it's kind of, uh, one of the major O minima structures. But uh, I mean, since then, people use this uh, name for various conjectures of this kind. I mean, so if you can improve the, the bound to really just a polynomial, then this is kind of an instance of the Wilkie conjecture. Uh, and well, as I said about the, in the slide on the pillow Wilkie itself, actually we can say something if the leaves contain algebraic curves. It's, it's not like we really must assume that they contain none. If they contain algebraic curves, then there is an extra term like the log distance to the nearest algebraic curve. But uh, okay, but just I don't want to get into this detail, so let, let's skip to this uh, simple formulation. And uh, finally, I also wanted to mention that the, the so, original. Uh, once again, to understand, uh, there is no proximity to uh, any proximity between leaves of uh, defoliation to same algebraic curves. So <clears throat> your polynomial does not depend uh, on how far away uh, you are from. Uh, well, here I have no such term because I assumed that V intersect L doesn't contain semi algebraic curves for any leaf. Okay, but I mean, in principle, it's possible that you have one leaf where V intersect L doesn't contain any curves. But on another leaf, it will contain semi algebraic curves. So, am I right that this formulation implies some uniformity that was absent in the previous, uh, previously formulated results? Uh, not really, because I'm just here, I'm kind of assuming something like, uh, well, the analog of assuming that sigma v is an empty state. Because, I mean, this assumption that the intersection contains no semi algebraic curves for any leaf. That's kind of saying no leaf has bad behavior. Okay, and if actually some leaves did have bad behavior, then there would be a log distance term in this in my result. And the full result does does have such a term. It's just that it would be complicated to exactly explain. I would have to introduce this pillar's notion of blocks, and I just chose to. Uniformity is not yet here. I mean, there is, uh, here I'm kind of just assuming that there are no no bad sets, but if there were bad sets, then, and I mean, it can happen that there are bad sets, then there would be a logarithmic distance to the bad locus inside this uh, result. So, I mean, this result is not uniform in that sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, so finally, I just wanted to say that here it's also polynomial in G. I mean, if you notice the, the pillar wilkie result, it was just some constant depending on G, and here, in the same way that we get uh, polynomial in A, we also get polynomial in G. And this is actually kind of a different asymptotic direction that wasn't really studied before in this point count in, in the pillar wilkie theorem. But it actually has very important consequences that are discovered by Harry Schmidt. So it can be used to, to give, a, to give a, like a Galois orbit lower bounds for torsion points or for... Uh, special points on Shimura variety. So, I mean, this is kind of, I, I will not get to talk about this direction, but I just wanted to say that I'm focusing on the dependence on height in this talk, but also the dependence on G is quite important in, in other applications. Okay, so kind of the main point why I wanted to get such a theorem is that uh, this pillar wilkie theorem has uh, some major applications connected to abelian varieties and to Shimura varieties or generally to, to mix Shimura varieties, it's some bigger class that contains both of these things. So there are applications that are discovered by Pila and Zania, and then Pila, uh, Masel Zania, and many people found many kind of interesting applications of this theorem and solved several uh, open problems using the, the Pila-Wilkie theorem. And the sets, if you kind of look at these proofs, the proof of uh, Pila, the proofs of Maselzani and, and other applications of Pila Wilkie, it turns out that you can always kind of realize the sets that you are applying the theorem to in terms of these leaves of foliations. So in, in these theorems, you're always counting rational points or algebraic points 
on some transcendental set. Okay, that's what the pillar wilkie theorem does. And it always turns out that this transcendental set actually is a leaf of a foliation. Okay, and moreover, this foliation has symmetries that kind of allows us to, to ensure that none of the sets contain semi-algebraic curves. Or, I mean, you have to really be deep into the proofs to understand the to understand how these things fit together. But just uh, trust me that not only do these sets always come up as leaves of foliations, but uh, the foliations have some symmetry that basically means that whenever you can apply the Pillar-Wilkie theorem, you can apply my theorem. So kind of my theorem has some assumption that none of the intersections contain semi-algebraic curves. But in the applications, once one of these intersections is OK, then all the other intersections are also going to be OK because of some kind of symmetry of the foliation. So I'll, I'll kind of briefly discuss the two maybe most major applications, and maybe you can get some, some sense for why really the, the sets that we need in the applications do actually come up as, as leaves of foliations. So any questions about this? OK, so I continue. Uh, so the first example I want to talk about is the under -oath conjecture for modular curves. So this is maybe the, the most, uh, I don't know, famous application of this Pillow-Wilkie theorem. It was a famous open problem, and it was solved, uh, well, it was solved under the generalized Riemann hypothesis by several people, by Edixhoven, Yafaev, uh, Ulmo, Klingler, but all of these proofs were assuming uh, the generalized Riemann hypothesis. And the first kind of general proof without assuming anything was a proof by Jonathan Pila and based on the pillar wilkie theorem. So I want to kind of briefly tell you what is the conjecture and, and what Pila did. So I'll start with some notations. So this H will be the upper half space. Uh, the curly F will be the usual fundamental domain. So I mean, um, I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. This the thing that has this kind of shape. Just a fundamental domain for the SL2Z action. And I denote uh, the quotient, H modulo SL2Z, I denote it by Y1. So this is the modular curve. Uh, as a Riemann surface, it is isomorphic to C. And it is just uh, the moduli space for elliptic curves. Okay, so you can think of every point in H as representing a lattice. The lattice generated by one and the point. And then the SL2Z action exactly tells you when two, two of these points generate the same lattice. So when you mod out by this SL2Z action, you get the moduli space of modular curves. Uh, and finally, I denote by J, the J function, j just the quotient map. Right? So the map that goes from H to this quotient. So this is called the Klein modular invariant. Uh, now, the interesting thing about this Y1 is that it contains a countable dense set of special points. So what are the special points? So every point in this modular curve represents an elliptic curve. So it's, it's C modular lattice, an elliptic curve. And usually these elliptic curves have only, I mean, the ring of endomorphism is only going to be Z. You can always, in any group, you, you always have an endomorphism just multiplying by an integer. But in some cases, you could have other endomorphisms. And uh, when you have them, this is called CM. It's, CM stands for complex multiplication. It means that there is some complex number such that when you multiply the lattice by this number, it, it sits inside the lattice. So in this case, we call the elliptic curve CM, or special. And uh, in terms of this uniformization by H, a point is going to be special if and only if it is the image of a quadratic number. Okay, so if you have a lattice generated by one and tau, then this lattice is it, it has CM if and only if tau is a quadratic number. It satisfies some quadratic equation over Q. Okay, and if this happens, then I write disk of P for the discriminant of tau. Discriminant of this quadratic number. Okay, so this, these are kind of the main act in this story, the special points, so the, the points that encode elliptic curves with complex multiplication. Now, there's also a notion of special curves. Um, so suppose you have some curve in, in uh, y1 square. You have kind of two copies of y1. 
we say that v is special if it is a factor of a modular polynomial. Okay, that, that, that doesn't tell you much if you don't know what these modular polynomials are, but let me give you a more uh, geometric uh, explanation. This means that there is an isogeny between P and Q. An isogeny means that, I mean, you have these two elliptic curves. These are two Riemann surfaces. So there could be maybe a map between them, kind of a group homeomorphism, a non-trivial group homeomorphism. If there is one, it is called an isogeny. And usually there, is not, there are going to be no isogenies. If you just pick two elliptic curves at random, you can't have any non-trivial maps between them. So when you do have a non-trivial map between them, this is called isogenous curves. And these relations, the modular polynomials, uh, this phi n, it, it exactly captures this. So the solutions, I mean, this phi n is going to vanish on a pair p, p and q if and only if there is an isogeny whose kernel is cyclic <coughs> order n. Okay, so if you've never seen this, it's not so crucial that you understand uh, the definition, but just know that there is some kind of collection of curves that we call special. And now what is the conjecture? What is the underworld conjecture? So I'm stating it only for, for y1 squared to keep it simple. So the conjecture says that if v is not special, then it will contain finitely many pairs of special points. Okay, and by the way, uh, vice versa, if v is special, then it contains infinitely many pairs of special points. Because whenever p is special and p is isogenous to q, then q is also special. So this interpretation by isogeny is it kind of explains why you have to you have to rule out this case. So if V is special, then you, there's nothing to talk about. There will be infinitely many. But the conjecture says that if V is not special, then there are finitely many kind of solutions in special points, pairs of special points that, that solve this equation. And uh, well, this is actually not the conjecture. This is the theorem of Andre. So Andre proved this theorem, and he conjectured something like this in in an arbitrary number of variables, or even for, for more general Shimura varieties and so on. But uh, I just want to give you kind of the rough idea for how this is proved by Pila. And Pila's proof, uh, what was special about it is that you could carry it out in the same exact way for, for y1 to the n and for other Shimura varieties. So it, it kind of generalizes easily, even though I will not show you that part. Uh, any questions about the statement first? Okay, so let me quickly show you the proof. So the main actor in this proof is the uniformization. So we have, uh, we have our F, remember it's the fundamental domain. So we have fundamental domain F and uh, we have the map J which goes from F onto Y1. And it kind of uniformizes uh, Y1. So I'll just take uh, a pair of copies of F and a pair of copies of the J map and in this way, I uniformize my uh, y1 squared. And now I'll take a transcendental set, which is the inverse image of v. Okay, so v, remember it's a curve inside y1 squared. So now I just pull it back and I get some curve in f squared. Now the, now the curve v is algebraic, right? It was an algebraic subset of y1 squared, but now I pulled it back by a transcendental map, right? By this j function, which is a, highly transcendental. So, I mean, generally you would assume that this is going to be uh, transcendental, right? That this, this pre-image is not going to contain any semi-algebraic curves. And in fact, you can check this. So this is not easy at all. This was one of the main steps in Pila's proof, but you can check that this X contains no semi-algebraic curves. More accurately, this X is going to be algebraic exactly if V is special. Okay, so if you take the preimage of a special curve, you get a algebraic curve upstairs. But if you take the preimage of a non-special curve, then there are no semi-algebraic curves. And then you can apply the pila wilkie theorem. Okay, so I'm going to be counting now points in this f square that belong to x. And the pila wilkie theorem tells me that the number of points, now I'll be looking at quadratic points, because remember that Three images of special points are quadratic. Right? I said that a point is special if and only if it's the image by J of a quadratic number. So I'm counting quadratic points of height H. 
and of log height h. And uh, well, the theorem tells me it's going to be e to the O small of h. So it's smaller than epsilon times h for any epsilon. Now, on the other hand, suppose that you do have a special point in V. We want to show that we have finitely many. So far, we just know that we have not too many of a given height. Like we, we know a bound in terms of the height, but still there can be infinitely many. Now, suppose that you have one which is special and denote the height of this special point by H. Then this H is basically like the log of the discriminant. Okay, it's very easy to see. You have a... I mean, if you have a quadratic number in the fundamental domain, then its discriminant is going to be roughly the same as its height. It's an easy computation. And now the deep kind of uh, part that you need is a result from class field theory that tells you that uh, the number of Galois conjugates is not going to be so small. It's going to be a constant times h. Okay, so, I mean, the, actually, in fact, all of the special points of the same discriminant are going to be Galois conjugate in the in the modular curve. This is not true for general Schumer varieties, but in this case, it's true. So you have some collection of special points of a given discriminant, and they're all Galois conjugated. And the number of these special points of a given discriminant by results of uh, brauer ziegel from analytic number theory, this is just some power of the discriminant. It's like a discriminant to the power one half minus epsilon for any epsilon. So anyway, the bottom line is that because of class field theory, you have a lower bound for the number of conjugates. OK, and each of these conjugates actually contributes a point to x. Okay, because if we have a point in v, then all of these conjugates are also going to be in v, because v is defined over q. And then the number of conjugates is e to the constant times h. But on the other hand, we said that the number of points of height h should be less than, than e to the epsilon h for any epsilon. So if epsilon is smaller than this constant, we get a contradiction. OK, so this is how Peel approves the, the underlot conjecture for y1 squared. Uh, so I just want to, uh, are there any questions about this? OK, so I want to kind of quickly just tell you what it has to do with foliations. So the point is that this modular invariant, it satisfies the differential equation. OK, so there are, you can write these equations in various ways. So I, I just chose one of them here, which is using the Schwarzian operator. So there is a differential equation saying that the Schwarzian of j plus you know, r of j times the derivative of j squared is 0, where r is some explicit rational function. You can find this in know, books on automorphic forms. So that basically means that we can encode the graph of j as a leaf of some foliation. OK, the graph of j is a trajectory of, of some vector field. And uh, if you want to take two copies, then you just take a, kind of a direct product of these two vector fields, and you get a two-dimensional foliation by the graphs of, uh, of this uh, of J function. So basically, when we are trying to do Pillar's proof, instead of uh, looking at a general transcendental set, we can encode everything using this foliation. Okay, so we, we will be looking at the, the graph of pi intersecting with our set V, and we will be counting there. There are some technicalities, like, for example, Pila really counts in this entire fundamental domain F. This is not a compact set. It has a cusp at infinity. And I only count in, in some big ball. Uh, but, I mean, just uh, you can trust me that for some technical reasons, you can avoid this. So, for example, you know that these Galois conjugates are actually equidistributed. So it means that uh, it's enough to... I mean, half of them are going to lie in some fixed big ball. So this is by result of Duke. But uh, and anyway, I mean, uh, disregarding this technical issue about compactness, basically you can carry, carry Pillar's proof uh, using foliations just without any change. So but what is the point of this? I mean, what do you gain by doing this? So one of the things that you gain is you gain polynomial dependence on the degree, the degree of P. So in Pillar's proof, there is just some constant. It de depends on your curve V, but you can't say anything about this constant. Uh, but if you kind of encode everything with foliations and you use the results I mentioned, then everything depends just polynomially on the degrees of the equations. 
So you get a result that depends polynomially on the degree of p, and that eventually means that you can find a polynomial time algorithm for computing all these special points. Like instead of just finding some up that there is an upper bound on the discriminant, you actually get a polynomial bound on the discriminant. And once you have such a bound, you can actually compute all of the special points in V. So this problem of finding all the special solutions, this is a problem which is decidable in polynomial time. Uh, I should mention, as is uh, written in red here, that even though there is a polynomial, I I'm only claiming that there exists a polynomial. We do not know what is the polynomial. So it's a, it's a little bit a strange statement. The problem is decidable, but we don't know what the polynomial is. The reason is this uh, Galois lower bound. So when I have, I, I had a class field theory result saying that PQ has a, you know, some e to the constant times h Galois conjugates. But we do not know what is this constant unless we assume the Riemann hypothesis. So we know that there, by Ziegler there exists such a constant, but it is a very deep problem to estimate this constant. Uh, so as long as we don't solve this, we, we can't really make an effective algorithm. I mean, we, we have an algorithm, but it should involve some constant, and we don't know what the constant is. Uh, OK, but nevertheless, that, that's what you have. There are some other results that I have where you actually you get around this problem for, for certain cases. But uh, OK, I will have no time to talk about this. So in general, this problem is definitely we don't know how to do it effectively, except for y1 square. I mean, y1 square, there's another approach by Lars Kuhne and another approach by Masser, Bilu, and Zanier, where they proved an effective bound, but it's only really for y1 square. So nothing else is known. And I mean, this result, this theorem that I have here, it's for any dimension. And in fact, even uh, more general Schumer varieties, for, for instance, the Ziegel modular varieties, we also have such a result. OK, so in the remaining, uh, I don't know, seven minutes, I want to talk about one other type of application, which is maybe a little bit less well known. So it's for the Pell equation. It's kind of a more uh, elementary, the problem at least. So there is the classical Pell's equation. It's basically the equation a squared minus d b squared is equal to 1. OK, and usually this is done over the integers. Like you take d is an integer, and you're looking for a and b integers such that this equation will will hold. OK, and in the integers, this is well understood, studied by, I don't know, Diophantus. I mean, start, people started studying this thousands of years ago, and uh, there's a very nice theory about it connected to continued fractions. But now I want to talk about the same problem, but in uh, polynomials. So just I'll take d, which is a polynomial in one variable, and I try to solve this equation with a and b also being polynomials. And actually, here the situation is uh, quite different. So there's a theorem of Masser and Zanias that says that if you take, for example, this polynomial, x to the 6 plus x plus t, then this Pell's equation here is going to be solvable only for finitely many t. Okay, there's only finitely many values of t such that you can solve the equation. Okay, so they prove this. Uh, I mean, it's a mix of results. I put here 2015, but uh, for this D, it was 2015. Then there are many developments. But uh, well, the, anyway, the, the result, as I have it written here, it's really 2015. But actually, by now, there is a criterion that works for any D. Okay, so this example, it's just uh, to keep things simple, but you can do it for any D. And uh, there are also many other extensions of these ideas by Master and Zanian by their students, uh, Fabrizio Bauero, Laura Capuano, and Harry Schmidt, and, and maybe others that I forget. Uh, but the, the, the kind of the main point I want to make is that even though we know that there's a finite set of T's such that this is solvable, there is no effective algorithm. I mean, this proof is only existential. It tells you there's a finite set, but it doesn't tell you how to find the, these T's. Now, I want to briefly show you how their proof works, because it's uh, really uh, remarkable and uh, kind of connected to very classical mathematics. So OK, let's fix some t. I'm, I'm taking a fixed t, and I'm looking at this hyperelliptic curve. y squared is equal to d. I mean, evaluated at t. So I'll denote this curve by c of dt. So everything depends on t. t, I think of as a parameter. Uh, now, why did I take this hyperelliptic curve? Because it allows me to factorize the equation, right? I mean, the equation was this 
a square minus d b square is equal to one. If d was just a square, then I could factorize this easily. So I'm making d into a square by saying that y square is equal to d, and then I can factorize. I can write that the solution should satisfy a minus y b times a plus y b is equal to one. So that actually means that you have here a regular function a minus y b. It is regular on this uh, on this curve, on this hyperelliptic curve c of uh, dt. And moreover, this function has no poles or zeros. So first of all, y doesn't, I mean, except at the point at infinity. So if you look at the... We got, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit confused. Yeah. There were two independent variables, x and t. Now, in which sense uh, you say if a polynomial solution to pair exists? A polynomial... So, so again, don't, don't think of t as a... As a I mean, think just of a fixed t. So I'm fixing t, and then I'm just looking. At, so my polynomials are kind of only in x. The t is just a number. So t should be considered as a parameter which can be uh, put down to the subscript, and then uh, your curve is indeed a hyperelliptic curve and the yeah. y plane. Yeah, so this d of t, I'm sorry, maybe I should have written d sub t of x. But I mean, this is a polynomial in x, and just uh, kind of, I'm, I'm evaluating for a fixed t. So everything okay. is a polynomial only in x. So then I'm saying that you get a regular function, because a is a polynomial in x, b is a polynomial in x, well, y is just a regular function on, the, on this hyperelliptic curve. And so it has no poles in the affine plane. But also it has no zeros because if it had if a minus y b had a zero, then a plus y b should have a pole, right? Because the product is one. But I mean, but a plus y b also has no poles for the same reason. It's just kind of you have a polynomial in x plus y times a polynomial in x, so there cannot be any poles. So that basically means you know a lot about the divisor. The divisor of this function, it can only have zeros and poles at the points at infinity. It has no zeros, no poles in the fine uh, chart. So now let's look at the Jacobian of this curve. So recall a Jacobian is a certain abelian variety. And there is the Abel-Jacobi map that takes any, you can take any divisor and map it to the sum of the points corresponding to this divisor in this abelian variety. Okay, so this is kind of the work of Abel Jacobi, this kind of classical mathematics of the 19th century. And the Abel Jacobi theorem exactly says that if you have a divisor, it's effective. So it's a divisor of a function. Like, for example, the divisor of a minus yb is zero in the Jacobian. In fact, it's if and only if. If you have some divisor, it's going to be zero in the Jacobian, if and only if it's the divisor of a function. Okay, so we know that the divisor of this a minus yb is zero. But what is this divisor? It's just because, I, I mean, I can have only two poles. I, I, I have no poles, no zeros at anywhere except the two points at infinity of this hyperelliptic curve. So there's two points at infinity, infinity one and infinity two. And these are the only two points where I can have uh, poles or zeros. And in fact, if one of them has a zero of order m, then the average should have a pole of order m, right? Because you know the sum of of the zeros and poles has to be zero just on any compact Riemann surface. So in fact, I get this kind of equality: zero is equal to some m, I don't know what m, times the difference, infinity one minus infinity two. Okay, so this this minus this is the the group law on the Jacobian. The Jacobian is an abelian variety. You have a group law. So I'm saying if you take infinity one, infinity two, take the difference. This is a torsion point. When you multiply it by some m, it will, it will be just zero in the Jacobian. Okay, and now everything is reduced to kind of looking at these uh, at, uh, torsion points in abelian uh, surfaces. So say you have a family of abelian surfaces. So, I mean, this will, this, we will think about the family of the Jacobians of these curves, C of dt. Okay, for every t, we have a hyperelliptic curve. So we have a family of hyperelliptic curve. And from this family, we get a family of Jacobians, so a family of abelian surfaces. And we have a section which takes every t to the difference between infinity 1 and infinity 2. 
in the corresponding Jacobian. And we want to know how often can this be a torsion point? Right, so you have a, a family of abelian surfaces, you have some section that to every point in the base associates some point in the abelian surface, and you're asking how often can it happen that this happens to be torsion? And the theorem says that unless the, the section is contained in a proper subgroup of your uh, abelian, of your family of abelian surfaces, then there will be only finitely many t such that it is torsion. Okay, so once you apply this theorem to, to this uh, context described in this slide, then you get the result about the Pell equation. So everything is reduced to studying kind of torsion sections. We, we take a section and we ask, when does it happen to be a torsion point? Uh, by the way, this assumption that S is not contained in a proper subgroup, it is a necessary assumption, and it's very similar to, to the assumption about not being a special curve. So when these proper subgroups, they are in some sense the analogs of, of the special curves from the previous case. And finally, I'm sorry, I see that I'm slightly late, but let me just show the, the final slide, if it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'll just uh, quickly, I, I don't go into the details of the proof, but just to show you that it's very similar to what Pila does. So it's kind of all in the same spirit. So we have this family of uh, abelian surfaces, AT. So let's write it as C square modulus some lattice. Right? So this lambda T is a lattice that depends on T. Now, we had our, we have a section. So the main point is that, I mean, we, we somehow want to translate everything to counting rational points. So the point is that a section is going to be torsion in AT, it's going to be a torsion point, if and only if, when you take the logarithm, so you lift it to C2, it's a rational combination of the generators. Okay, so I mean, if, if it's just an integer combination of generators, then it is just zero, right? I mean, the, and the, the, the lattice itself goes to zero in this uh, uniformization. But if you have a rational combination of the generators, then after you multiply by some integer, you will land in the lattice, and then you will be zero. So it means it will be a torsion point. And moreover, the order of torsion is going to be basically the height of the coefficients. So if you have like a combination of the generators where the, the numerator is 10, then this is going to be roughly 10 torsion. Okay, so in the same way as in the proof of Pillar, if we apply now the Pillar and Wilkie theorem, we see that the number of T's where we can have N torsion is very small. It's, it's kind of, it's this N to the epsilon. Okay, so it's a kind of negligible in N. Just by counting the, each torsion point is a rational point and we know how many rational points we have, so we get this. And then, uh, questions? No, no, no. And then on the other hand, as before, if we have a torsion point of order n, it must have many Galois conjugates. Okay, so, th so this is a result from the arithmetic of uh, abelian varieties. In fact, this can be proved also using uh, this stronger counting theorem. This is one of the ideas of Harry Schmidt that I mentioned. But I mean, this is not the first proof. So the, the first proof is due to uh, David, and there's also a proof due to Massa, but Anyway, we know that the number of Galois conjugates grows like some power of n. And then when you compare these two things, you get a contradiction. Right? On the one hand, you're supposed to have very few n torsion points. On the other hand, once you have one of them, then it brings all of its friends, all of the Galois conjugates come along, and it's already too many. So just you see that starting with some n, you can have no torsion points of, of this order. And this is where you get finiteness. And well, again, as before, I want to say that everything here can be encoded using foliations. Okay, so this uh, lambda t that you have here, it is the kind of the lattice representing your uh, abelian surface. So the entries of this, I mean, the, ge the generators of this lattice are exactly the complete hyperelliptic integrals. Okay, or I mean, in general, it will be just some pure, I mean, for, in the example of Pell's equation, these will be complete hyperelliptic integrals, and they satisfy picard fuchs equations. If you take like a general family of abelian surfaces, this will be just periods of this family of surfaces, and it will satisfy uh, the gauss manin system of equations. And you also need the logarithm of S. 
So the logarithm of s, it's an incomplete hyperelliptic integral, right? You are kind of integrating from a base point to infinity one minus the integral from a base point to infinity two. And these incomplete hyperelliptic integrals also satisfy some picard fuchs type equations. It's an inhomogeneous picard fuchs equation. So using this kind of the fact that all of your functions satisfy differential equations, you can encode the entire structure using uh, differential equations, and then you can use the, the counting results that I showed to make everything effective here. So in this case, there, there are no issues about the constants. So the, the con all the constants are for the Galois lower bounds are completely effective. So here we really get that there is an explicit polynomial time algorithm for finding all of the t's, all of the solutions, because we, we get a polynomial upper bound for n for the order of torsion, and then you can compute everything. Uh, so yeah, I'm sorry, I'm five minutes late, and the last thing I wanted to say, so thank you, and okay. sorry for that. Uh, thank you, God. that's it. Any question? I have three questions, but I have to see whether. God, uh, the question is as follows: Many years ago, when we, with Nita Novikov, discussed the non-oscillation of solutions of polynomial ODEs, uh, I uh, looked for a way to formulate uh, formulate the result for non-specialists, and then uh, we. <coughs> arrive to the following uh, approximate or vague statement that uh, a finite piece of a trajectory of a polynomial vector field uh, from the point of view of intersection with algebraic subvarieties behaves itself like an algebraic subvariety, although uh, of the degree which is not equal to the degree of the polynomial equations, but uh, something which is much larger, but still uh, it was uh, algebraic-like formulation. Now, uh, you are treating the situation where you are not just counting intersections. This was the first part of your talk. But you rather count rational points or uh, some uh, special points uh, on uh, leaves of foliations defined by polynomial ODEs. So uh, there are some results that show how fast the number of a, uh, say, well, I would stick to the uh, simplest possible formulation, how fast the number of rational points on algebraic varieties grows as you allow for higher height, uh, for the height to grow to infinity. Now, yeah. can you, uh, remaining on the same level of uh, vagueness to uh, formulate uh, your results about uh, the di distribution on, of, uh, say, special, or rational, or whatever you call them, points on uh, transcendental leaves of uh, polynomial foliations, integral polynomial foliations. So do they behave like a algebraic varieties in a sense, or do they behave in a uh, more uh, sophisticated way? It's a good question because the, the situation here is exactly opposite of, uh, of the situation with counting intersections. So when you have an algebraic uh, variety, count intersections, you have very good upper bounds for the possible number of intersections. And when you look at the transcendental set, you have something probably worse. And then the issue is to understand how worse or how similar it is to the algebraic case. But in fact, when you're counting rational points, it's the opposite. So if the curve is transcendental, it has very few rational points. And that's what Rila will show us. If the curve is algebraic, then it can contain many rational points. So, in fact, the most classical result in this direction is by Bombieri and Pila, show that if you have a, if you have a curve, let's say an irreducible curve of degree D, C squared, then the number of rational points is bounded by uh, the height to the power two over D. Okay, so as D becomes bigger and bigger, you can get fewer and fewer points. 
and as d tends to infinity, you kind of get h to the epsilon. Now, the reason that this happens is that, I mean, to, to count the number of rational points, you're actually showing that all of the rational points belong to some algebraic curve. So if your curve is transcendental, you can intersect the algebraic curve with the transcendental curve. But if your curve is algebraic, then at some point, it's just uh, kind of you intersect and you get everything. Uh, you, know, you know that I have some curve. I know that I'm looking for rational points. They all belong to some other algebraic curve. But I mean, these two curves can be the same. And when one of the curves is transcendental, these two curves can't be the same. So that's why kind of the, all of this pillow will keep in this. You must assume that you are dealing with transcendental. There is a very rich theory for counting rational points in, in algebraic varieties as well, but it's kind of a different, uh, it's a different animal. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other question in the recorded session? Because we will have a uh, recorded one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so perhaps a bit related to what Professor Yakovenko said, just in a different way. Is there any way to count points of, say, higher multiplicity using these techniques? Uh, so what, what do you mean, points of higher multiplicity? Points where the intersection with the uh, foliation is of higher multiplicity? Yeah, yeah. So, for example, you have a trajectory which uh, parabolically, in, well, touches onto a leaf. For example. Yeah, so I mean, all of my results are kind of count are complex analytic, and they count with multiplicity. So actually, I mean, when I say there's a certain bound for the number of intersections, this is a bound with multiplicity. Uh, if all of the points are you know of multiplicity n, then actually the number is going to be n times uh, smaller. Uh, um, now, if you, if you ask about the rational points, uh, then I'm not sure. I mean, such things are often used in the Fulton approximation. Uh, yeah. Many times you, you try to cook up these polynomials where they have a higher order zero at every every point, and sometimes this really improves the things that you get. Like many in Baker's method, like many many uh, kind of results that follow Baker's method. But I'm not sure that there is such a thing uh, around this pillar. Wheel. It's, it's an interesting question. I've never seen such a such a strategy employed. And if you, for example extend to allow more than analyticity so you say allow flat terms in your expansions do you think some of these results can be recovered well so the general results are for what are called all minimal structures and these all minimal structures can contain flat things so there is an all minimal structure that contains the the exponential e to the x and then using that you can uh, cook up flat terms like e to the minus one over x is definable and the pillow will keep your still holds. Uh, whether you can get these uh, these sharper bounds for such things, this is a this is the Wilkie conjecture. So can you get this result, for example, for the structure R sub X? I think you can. In fact, uh, you know we are working on it with Dmitry Novikov, but uh, so far it is okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No question. Okay, so let's thank the speaker and go to the next session of informal questions. Maybe just nice.